Uh, all right, so I'm very excited today to have Mario Crane back uh, with us to talk about a topic that I'm very excited about. Uh, it's related to what I used to do in my previous life, quantum optics, uh, and more importantly, designing experiments for quantum optics. That's what I did for eight years, almost a decade. Uh, and I'm very excited to see uh, the, the interesting ideas that Mario has been working on um, and to share those with you. So we are doing this session in the slightly newer format that we uh, started recently, which is uh, we are going to have a relatively short presentation and spend most of the time discussing things. Uh, just to give you a bit of background about Mario, uh, he is an Irvin Schrodinger fellow. He uh, is an Erwin Schrodinger Fellow at the University of Toronto and the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And he's part of uh, Alain Aspero Guzik's uh, research group, uh, who's one of the very well known uh, scientists in the area of quantum chemistry. Um, Mario received his PhD in physics at, from the University of Vienna uh, in 2017. Uh, his research focuses on quantum inspired and computer augmented science. Uh, and on how to use quantum algorithms to create, sorry, how to use quantum algorithms creatively in science. Uh, some of the topics that he works on are uh, computer inspired quantum experiments and molecule designs, as well as uh, the so called uh, semantic networks for predicting future research directions in quantum physics. So I'm very excited to have Mario. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming back. I'm just going to do a quick uh, motivation about the topic that you worked on and then uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to jump into uh, some of the concepts that you're using in this work uh, to make sure that everyone is on the same page about what we're talking and then we're going to go to the presentation all right so uh, the motivation for this work is that uh, the design of quantum experiments can be very challenging partly to do the fact that there are some uh, counterintuitive concepts in quantum physics, like superposition or entanglement. Uh, sometimes we are interested in a specific functionalities in these experiments uh, and working backwards from the desired outcome to these functionalities uh, is something interesting that we want to do. And uh, using uh, ideas like that, we can design quantum experiments to uh, study uh, interesting quantum states. Um, and doing this manually is very difficult because of the problem that I mentioned. So in recent years, uh, researchers have been using uh, inverse design ideas uh, to uh, study how we can go from uh, the functionalities that we hope and expect to what we should design and actually implement in a lab. And some of these uh, ideas are machine learning and data driven. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that Mario and his colleagues have come up with this idea of uh, an alternative approach to solving this problem. And the reason that they went for this alternative approach is that the data driven and machine learning driven methods are usually slow and require a large amount of data and only work in very specific settings. So generalizability of those ideas is often challenging. Uh, so the system that they came up with is called uh, Tessos. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but hopefully it's close enough. It is a physics inspired and graph theoretical representation of a quantum state, which makes it significantly faster than previous comparable approaches uh, to, to study, uh, to do the inverse design problem. It, one of the intriguing things for me about this work is that uh, in addition to that, it also boils down the design into its core concepts. And what that allows us to do is that we can in, uh, intu use our intuition to understand those co core concepts and use those to generalize the ideas. And uh, we will have a little more discussion about that. But one of the very intriguing sentences in this whole paper for me is that they argue, therefore, that their algorithm contributes directly to the central aim of science, which is a very interesting claim. And we will talk a lot more about that. So Mario, thank you for being here. Uh, and if it is OK with you, let's go through some of the concepts used in this paper. 
to put everyone on the same page. Um, so one thing that I would say right up front, uh, which is uh, something that is not immediately obvious to a lot of people, but it is, you know, super, uh, you know, uh, everyday kind of work is that we use a lot of complex numbers. So some of the uh, concepts that we're going to work with uh, as we go through this presentation refer to complex numbers. So just be in that me mental mindset. All right, so your work specifically talks about photonic quantum states. Do you mind uh, describing what do you mean by that? What is a quantum state and what, is, what do you mean by a photonic quantum state? Yeah, uh, sure. A photonic quantum state um, is the way how we describe um, um, the, the fundamental states of light. So if you boil down uh, light to its smallest units, uh, you um, come to photons and those uh, uh, photons are uh, quantum states and you can have um, very complex um, states of light for instance you can have superposition states of light um, that would mean you have one uh, photon for uh, for instance you could consider the polarization of photon and this photon could be at the same time in a horizontal polarization that means it's electric field um, um, oscillates in a horizontal way uh, or in a vertical polarization, which means its um, electric field um, oscillates in, in a vertical way. A different way to think about this is the famous double slit experiment where one particle could go through a left and a right slit at the same time. And before you measure it, actually you don't know through which slit the particle, in that case, the photon went. Um, you can also have uh, multi-particle superpositions, and that is one thing that um, that uh, we are working with, and that is very exciting. This multi-particle states, uh, multi-particle and um, superposition states are called entanglement. This is when you have uh, two or more particles, um, and those particles. Um, share the same property. So both of them, for instance, are in a horizontal polarization or both of them are in a vertical polarization. Um, the, the property of superposition, as I said before, is that before you measure the state, you don't know in which of those two cases um, you are. Now, the crazy thing with entanglement is that you can now take um, these two particles, bring them very far away. Um, and before you measure the system, you don't know in which state they are. Both, uh, both are in the same state, but uh, you don't know in which one. And when you measure the first particle uh, and you see that it's horizontally or vertically polarized, in that moment, the other state also takes exactly this property. But uh, beforehand, um, it doesn't have uh, this defined property. Um, so polarization um, of photons is a very important degree of freedom for quantum information processing because it encodes a bit of information. So horizontal could be zero, vertical could mean one. And actually, because it's a, um, because it's a quantum system, it encodes not only a bit, but a, a qubit, a quantum bit. So it encodes in a quantum superposition um, this uh, binary um, information. Um, what I will talk about uh, later is or are systems that not only that can not only carry two um, states like horizontal or vertical, but can carry uh, many more states. You can think of that, um, for instance, as color. Um, light um, could be in a special wavelength, and wavelength corresponds to the color that we perceive. Um, so you could think about a high dimensional system of uh, one particle being in a superposition of being red or blue or green or other colors. So this is a high dimensional system which can encode much more information. And I would like to mention one classical example which I find extremely interesting, namely uh, the arguably the most important information carrier in the world is also a high dimensional system, namely DNA. 
DNA carries information in uh, four uh, letters, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And um, uh, so it also forms it. It, it encodes the, the information in a four-dimensional way. And we work with similar things in the quantum system. Perfect. Thank you so much for that explanation. It definitely took me a while when I started doing quantum mechanics to wrap my head around these, but hopefully that explanation can give you a bit of a starting point. Um, so you, you said that you're using, uh, like in your work, you're talking about how we use uh, particles of light, like photons, as uh, carriers of information that then we can do quantum information processing on it. Uh, but let's talk about how you do the processing uh, and how these photons are generated. So there are uh, concepts around linear optics that you talk about in your paper, concepts around uh, probabilistic photon sources, post-selection, uh, photon counts. So uh, if you don't mind, could you go through those uh, very quickly? Yeah. Um, so um, one of the sources, how we, how we uh, create BS or entangled uh, BS of photons um, in the experimental lab um, are so-called nonlinear crystals. These are special um, uh, nonlinear optics effects where you have uh, one particle with a specific uh, energy <clears throat> that um, splits into uh, two particles with half of the energy. Um, so usually this would be a, a blue photon with the wavelength of 400 nanometer, which splits into two red photons with wavelengths of 800 nanometer. And those um, pairs and um, those pairs of photon um, are usually the, um, the beginning of quantum experiments or of many quantum experiments. There are also uh, in recent years other type of, uh, of sources which are developed, but um, this nonlinear crystal also uh, known as spontaneous parametric down conversion uh, crystals. They are, um, um, they are very uh, well used uh, all over the world in basically all uh, quantum optics labs. So this is how we uh, create particles. One problem that I will mention uh, later is that the process of, of splitting this blue photon into two red photons is probabilistic. That means um, it happens not with a probability one, but actually it happens with a probabil probability that is 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine. So it's very, very unlikely that this happens. So usually one doesn't send only one blue photon, but one sends a very strong laser into the crystal and then uh, you get a decent amount of, of photon pairs. Um, now, if we uh, if we have um, this photon pairs created, we can we can use actually more crystals and and create more uh, pairs at the same time. So we have more particles, which I will talk about later. Um, now we can use something like um, nonlinear uh, linear optics. Linear optics are elements where uh, you don't change the wavelength of the photons. Basically, so you keep uh, you keep um, the photon number conserved. So that could be beam splitters, which change the path of the photons, or wave plates um, that, that could change um, the phase of uh, the particles, or mode shifters, which could make, for instance, a horizontal photon or a vertical photon, and these elements. So uh, those are the elements that we can uh, use to operate uh, with the particles. And finally, in the end, we have uh, single photon detectors. Um, there are also uh, different uh, type of detectors. Um, but usually what they do is they detect, um, they detect uh, a single photon and um, uh, give an electrical uh, signal to uh, the computer. And uh, you can use then um, uh, post-selective uh, information um, we can uh, collect those electrical signals and see which photons uh, uh, you have measured and uh, which states uh, uh, have been there in your in your quantum system. Great. 
Thank you. Uh, just to quickly wrap up what you said uh, and put it in context, mm -hmm. uh, the audience can imagine the crystal uh, where a strong blue laser is shining on it. And let's say these laser lights are coming in pulses, so we know roughly when the photons might have been generated. So we shine the blue light on the crystal. There are potentially a pair of photons generated, but we can't be sure because it is a probabilistic process. But how we get around it is that we let this go through all the experiment, and at the end of it, we have photon detectors that can go click if there is a photon. So. And we know the time window that they are supposed to arrive if they are generated. So that's the idea of post-selection that Mario will uh, will talk about at some point. Um, so essentially what we do is that we shine a strong blue laser, a pair of photon might be generated, it goes through the experiment. Most of the time we ignore it because there, wasn't, there weren't uh, any pairs of photons generated or they were lost or whatever. But every time that they go click on the detector, we know that the photon was generated so, you know, post hoc, we know that the photon was generated and went through the experiment. So in those time windows are the ones that we sort of post select and look at the results. All right, one more concept and we then mm -hmm. jump into the presentation. Uh, when you are, so essentially the idea that you're pursuing is that uh, you can map this quantum state of these photons into these graphs and then use an optimization method to boil it down to the simplest possible. Uh, you know, graph with the properties that you're looking for. Uh, and for that optimization, you're using a loss function that is based on quantum fidelity. Can you tell us uh, what that quantum fidelity means? <clears throat> yes. So uh, quantum fidelity basically tells you um, how close is your current state to a specific target state. So let's say you want to create a, a specific quantum state because you want to work with it later. Um, you want to know how how close um, your state is um, to the specific uh, target. And so it basically uh, is an overlap uh, measure or a, a distance measure uh, for quantum states. Great. So essentially, uh, I guess for those who are familiar with things like cosine distance, uh, in some representation, quantum fidelity you can sort of wave your hand and think about it as a cosine distance between two vector representations of uh, quantum states. That's not the only definition. Uh, it is, I'm waving my hands as I'm saying that, but you know, that's, that's close enough. Uh, and, and you're using topological uh, optimization to, to essentially uh, find the, the desired quantum state. Just maybe say a sentence about that, you know, how, like, what is the, the basic idea of topological optimization, and then we can jump into the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the idea of topological optimization is that you um, that you minimize the, the structure of the graph. So you minimize the, the complexity or the, the number of edges, for instance, of the graph, that you um, get a minimum, uh, a minimal structure, a minimal uh, structure of that solution that you're searching for. Perfect. So essentially, that's an optimization that works on the topology of yeah. the state, the graph that you're working on. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Com uh, commonly, optimizations are done parametrically, but in this approach, we uh, combine the parametric with the structural optimization. Right. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for helping us get the basis covered. So let's go to the presentation now. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me back. It's a pleasure to uh, talk uh, with you about this. Um, so the work I'm, um, I'm presenting has been done together with my uh, colleagues Jakob Kottmann, Nora Tischler, and Alana spuro Gusik in um, Alan's um, MetaLab group. Okay, so... Um, Recent years have seen a huge number of application of artificial intelligence in various fields of science. And just a few examples are the, um, they're used for designing new functional materials uh, in chemistry, or they, they can be used for detection of new exoplanets in astronomy, or they can be used for identifying uh, interesting in, uh, events in high energy physics, 
um, colliders um, and so on, it shows that there is a huge opportunity for AI in science. And those applications uh, usually use very clever optimization and control and classification tools or generative models, which in the future can have real um, significant impact. What I will um, argue is that there is another huge potential that uh, hasn't really been uh, investigated much. And if it has been investigated, then mainly using toy examples. So the question um, I'm talking about is how can we actually get scientific understanding through AI? Scientific understanding has sometimes been called the essential or central aim of science. And therefore, um, any progress uh, towards answering this question can have decisive impact. So to, to get some inspiration um, to answer this question, we can actually analyze um, insights from philosophy of science. So over the last decade, uh, philosophers have understood that scientific understanding can probably only be described in a pragmatic way. Hank Direct, who has just published a, a book called Understanding Scientific Understanding, um, which is not only a very cool name for a book, but also won him the Lakatosh Award for uh, Best Contribution in Philosophy of Science. So he argues that scientists can understand a phenomenon if they can recognize um, qualitatively characteristic consequences, and now that's important, without performing exact calculations. So scientific understanding is fundamentally connected with the skill of using concepts fruitfully without exact calculations. We will keep this idea in mind when we now uh, try to develop uh, new ways for designing quantum experiments and quantum hardware. So, um, as Amir already mentioned, quantum experiments um, are very challenging um, to design, but they are important because they are uh, used for probing some of these uh, weird um, fundamental predictions that um, physics makes. And not only testing these fundamental properties, um, they are also important for um, uh, for designing and actually um, improving or developing practical applications, such as quantum enhanced sensing methods or uh, imaging methods or for quantum computers. Unfortunately, um, because of those weird effects like superposition and entanglement, um, designing this, um, uh, these experiments and configurations um, is very difficult uh, for humans. And therefore, several years ago, um, we have started to use actually artificial intelligence to um, help uh, with this uh, design project. Um, and uh, several of those uh, experiments have actually been um, implemented in, in um, laboratories and have enabled the investigation of new uh, phenomena that hasn't been um, observed before. Uh, here's one picture of a, uh, actually a computer designed experiment uh, that was proposed in, in um, the paper ref uh, in reference one. So um, while there are some successes, there are uh, huge problems. Namely, those uh, methods are usually very slow and uh, that restricts them to only very small systems. And importantly, the solutions are very difficult uh, to understand. So this is where our new approach um, comes in. We call it Tessos, um, which is from Greek mythology. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, um, and so Tessos, the, the main idea is um, that it uses a physics, an abstract physics representation of quantum optics. And this uh, representation allows for a significant uh, speed up um, compared to previous approaches. And now this speed up is very important because 
it allows for topological optimization, which is usually extremely slow. And this topological optimis um, optimization um, usually leads to kind of the conceptual course of the solutions. And now um, we can, we can um, physically interpret this conceptual course um, and the physical representation of this conceptual course. And um, in all of the uh, cases that we have tried, we were actually able to find new interpretation, um, new interpretations and generalize um, the solutions. And um, this, um, this is uh, connected to, um, or this shows that we were able to understand the solutions and that we, we understand the solutions that uh, was provided, provided to us uh, from uh, Tesla's, from our algorithm. <clears throat> okay. Um, so now let me uh, explain uh, the representations. So in Tesla's, we uh, represent quantum optics experiments as a weighted um, colored graph. And here, every vertex stands for a photonic path. Every edge stands for a pair of photons in these two uh, paths. The weight of the edge corresponds to the amplitude of that photon pair. And the color of the edge corresponds to the uh, photonic mode. For instance, blue could stand for horizontal polarization and red could stand for vertical polarization. Now, each of those graphs can be directly translated into uh, one or several um, quantum optics experiments. And, um, the in, and um, also every quantum optics experiment uh, can be translated into one um, uh, weighted colored graph. And now the important thing is that um, the quantum state that emerges from such an experiment can be directly written as a, a function of the weights of the graph. Okay, so uh, the important thing is that, um, can actually uh, continue, that um, such a, a graph represents at the same time the experimental setup and uh, the quantum state that corresponds to the setup. And we have the quantum state represented now as a, um, as a function of the weights of the graph. That means we can also write now um, objective functions in terms of the weights. For instance, if you would want um, to design an experiment that produces a specific quantum state, we could write the fidelity in terms of the weights of the graph. Now, um, in, uh, with this uh, tool, the design of um, quantum optical experiments boils down to the optimization of um, um, objective function. And um, in this case, our optimization is actually a minimization um, of a loss function. And this loss function contains uh, the fidelity. So it's actually one minus the fidelity. The fidelity should become one because we want to be as close as possible to the quantum state. So one minus fidelity should be zero. Plus we add an additional L1 regularization term, which leads, um, which leads to the fact that many of the weights of, um, of the graph become zero or become very small. So um, for, uh, for optimizing um, this um, function, it's a highly nonlinear function uh, in, in terms of the weights of the graph, we use the BFGS algorithm. And it is a um, highly efficient gradient-based uh, method that uses not only gradients, but also information about the uh, second order derivatives, so about the Hessian. And the interesting thing is that um, this algorithm, even if we have an objective function of hundreds of uh, weights, 
um, it usually finds a solution within seconds, even not at the normal computer. That is highly impressive. So the BFGS algorithm is highly impressive. Okay, so uh, what we get back from the optimization um, is a um, is a array of of uh, weights that correspond to the or that stand for the weights of the graph, and we could then uh, we could then uh, build a, a setup uh, with these weights. But uh, we start with a very large graph. That means it is very difficult to optimize um, uh, to to build such experiments. So what we do, and what uh, this, this fast BFGS algorithm allows us, is we add a, a topological optimization loop. So uh, it's an iterative loop, and in every case when we solve the solution, uh, when we solve the optimization problem, if we find a solution where the fidelity is larger than some threshold, maybe 99%, uh, then we take one edge of the original graph and remove it. And we could, for instance, take the edge that has the smallest weight. So we remove the edge with the smallest weight and we restart the optimization. But now we restart, of course, um, at, the, at different initial conditions, the initial conditions that we already know that that worked. So it's even faster than in the first iteration. And this topological optimization loop, we continue and um, uh, in every loop, the graph becomes smaller and smaller. So smaller and smaller means less and less edges. And at some point, um, it's not possible to minimize the structure of the graph anymore. And in that case, um, we finish the topological optimization. So the, what we get in the end is a, um, is a graph that uh, has a small number of edges, and we know the weights that correspond to those edges. Now let's uh, briefly uh, compare this algorithm to previous approaches in terms of speed. So first we compare the ability to find high dimensional free particle entangled states. We restrict the local uh, dimension um, of the photons to a certain number, to, to nine, uh, such that there's only a finite number of possible solutions. Now, a topological um, search algorithm with some learning mechanism, I was able to identify 51 of 81 uh, states in roughly 150 hours. Uh, improvement using uh, extension using reinforcement learning was able to find roughly uh, 17, so, uh, 17 solutions in uh, 10 hours. And our new algorithm finds these 17 solutions within two seconds and 51 in 15 minutes. So one sees it's significantly faster. A more challenging task is the search for high dimensional controlled operation where one particle controls the other particle. A topological search algorithm was able to identify actually the, the first such high dimensional controlled operation and it used for that roughly 150,000 CPU hours. So three months at the um, 80 core machine. Our new algorithm can find a solution within one second. And actually the experimental solution is simpler than the, the previous one. So it indicates that our new algorithm can now actually be applied to real open problems. And um, I will describe uh, very briefly, uh, just to give an idea of um, how we apply it. So in this example, we want to find high dimensional GLZ states. The GLZ state is where uh, it's kind of the, the most entangled state uh, you can have. And the high dimensional one would mean that you have a number of particles, for instance, you have six particles, where all of the six particles are in a state zero, or all of them are in a state one, or all of them are in a state two. Um, interestingly, the, um, uh, the two-dimensional special case, the qubit special case, is very well understood experimentally, and people have uh, built those in, in labs for many years. But the high-dimensional generalization actually has been conjectured to 
uh, need more resources and is not possible with only uh, the resources um, the resources of, of uh, six photons in, in this case. So we try to find um, we try to find actually some of these impossible states and uh, the simplest one, and the smallest one is a three-dimensional six-particle state. This one was thought to be not possible without additional resources. And uh, we apply our algorithm and very quickly within a few seconds, uh, it actually finds um, a solution. It actually finds a solution that, um, that was uh, thought to not exist before. And the solution is a uh, um, is a superposition of four different terms, where the first three terms correspond actually to this um, to this perfect three-dimensional chilled set state that we were searching for, and the last term is a um, other term, but the other term that has nothing to do with this chilled set state. But the algorithm found a way to um, um, to suppress this fourth term um, with a coefficient to the power of uh, free. So it, it found a way to suppress this additional term such that one can get theoretically arbitrary high fidelities. And the idea of what the algorithm has done here is immediately obvious um, if one looks at this graph. It just weights all of the edges um, that are that um, that are part of this additional term with a number c that is smaller than one. And then in that case, um, you can get rid of these additional uh, terms. And this idea can be immediately uh, used by, by us uh, now to generalize to other cases. For instance, we can immediately write down an eight particle um, three dimensional state or other higher uh, dimensional <coughs> states without needing to perform any additional um, computations, just from understanding how, um, how Desos was able to solve uh, this question. And with that, we show in the simple example that we were actually able to learn a new um, idea, new concept from the solution that the um, computer has provided to us. And yeah. Uh, we have also um, applied this technique to several other um, to several other open questions. For instance, one is a, a question of heralded quantum state, which are specifically important for applications because they are um, they are the resource state for photonic quantum computers. So, multi-particle um, heralded quantum states uh, can be used as resources for photonic quantum computing. And we were able to find actually the uh, most efficient uh, way that's known um, experimentally. Um, and also in this case, we start with the most general uh, graph um, and we perform the topological optimization and the topological optimizer um, gives us a very nice interpretable structure. So it's immediately clear in this case, that's a two particle heralded state, um, how to generalize um, this to other to other dimensions. Um, now I would like to uh, sum up um, just by saying uh, by, by uh, summarizing that we have this uh, new very efficient inverse design algorithm um, that uses a physical representation and the topological optimization uh, usually uncovers, in basically all cases that we have tried, uncovers a conceptual core of the solution that uh, we humans can then um, use, we can uh, interpret it, and we can um, generalize it. And thereby, uh, we show that we actually gain some scientific understanding. And as a very last um, thought, I would uh, like to uh, say or think about that actually philosophy of science could be a quite productive guiding principle, guiding line in the development of new AI algorithm for science. And I would be very excited to see this done more in the future. 
Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, so let's do some discussion about this. Uh, very impressive work. Uh, there was some comment on YouTube saying that uh, they're very impressed by the performance um, of the model. Uh, so let's get a little deeper into it. So I think one of the most interesting parts that you uh, showed us was uh, the mapping of the quantum state to the graph. Mm -hmm. So can we go back to that and take a look at it and walk us slowly through what's happening there? Mm -hmm. um, I think you had the simpler case that was uh, just a four node. Yeah, yeah this is one, right? Uh, we connected. Do you see the model? Uh, now, now I do, do. yeah. Yeah, that one. Yes. OK. So mm -hmm. did you have like a fully connected version of that one? Uh, yes, yes, but I don't, I don't have, have the experimental setup, setup because uh, okay. Actually, Actually, I didn't try it because it's, it's so super complicated. complicated. I mean, it's right. not so super complicated, complicated but, but it's very large. large. You definitely uh, don't want to build it in the lab, lab and I don't, I don't want to try it. So. <laughs> Sounds okay. good. So, so could you walk us through? Yes. What I'm seeing in that picture is notes, edges, mm -hmm. colors, and weights. Yes. Can you tell us quickly what each of those are? Mm -hmm. Can you see my mouse? Uh, I don't think I do. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, so, the um, on the left side, the vertices stand for the photonic paths. You can think about them uh, as spatially separated locations where the photons are flying, and in the end, um, you could have a detector. And in the case, uh, in the case on the right side, we have actually detectors in the path A, B, C, and D. So in, in this special case, you could uh, think about the vertices actually being the detector in the very end of the experiment. Um, the edges correspond to photon pairs. And in the intro, we already mentioned that, the that photon pairs conventionally are generated with nonlinear crystals where um, this, this one higher energetic photon is split into two lower energetic photons. And in uh, let's go to the to the lowest um, to the uh, lowest experiment. This is the most simplest uh, connection, and that is actually how we found some of the uh, some of this connection. So if you look at um, in this third experiment, the lowest one, um, there are four um, gray squares, and each of them correspond to one nonlinear crystal. And now let's look at um, the nonlinear crystal number three. So there are Roman numbers, and number three um, is the nonlinear crystal that um, is connected to detector A and B. And we can look in the graph. Um, again, we see such a uh, such an edge between A and B. That's the blue upper edge, uh, and this edge corresponds to um, a photon pair that's created in that specific crystal three. The weight of that crystal, um, you can think about. Uh, as the, for instance, the pump power. So how strong do I, um, do I illuminate this crystal? Um, that will linearly influence the number of particles that you get out, the number of photon pairs that you get out. So the weight of that crystal, you can think about it as the, um, uh, as the uh, power of the pump. Um, now I write here um, that this crystal, um, the weight is a uh, weight AB zero zero, and zero could uh, could stand for the polarization of um, of the photon pair. Zero zero could mean that both photons are in horizontal polarization. And uh, in this case, uh, we have now the connection 
to all properties. We know that this pair in that crystal is created in horizontal polarization. And we know that the weight um, corresponds to the, um, to the pump power of the crystal, uh, to the pump power that illuminates the crystal. Um, and the, the photons go to the detector AP. And we can do the same thing for, for all other three crystals. And then we get one representation of, um, of this graph. So this setup then corresponds exactly to the graph that's shown on the left. Uh, you, can, you can also see it in, uh, in many different ways. So for instance, this middle experiment is a way how you would uh, build such an experiment on an integrated photonic chip. There you would not play with polarization, but you would play actually with some spatial, um, with some dis discrete spatial uh, locations of the photons. And uh, this could be represented in the, in the middle picture. And then there are also other ways how you can represent, but yeah. Okay, uh, just, just to check my understanding then, mm -hmm. Uh, I think I'm simplifying what you said, like what you said is definitely the, the extended version of what I'm about to say, but can I think about A, B, C, and D in this picture as, say, the detectors? Uh, <clears throat> Roman yes. 1, 2, 3, 4 are essentially the crystals that you potentially have as the sources of photons, and color red and blue uh, is photonic mode, so that could potentially be polarization. Yes. Um, and then the amplitude, the omegas, uh, are essentially the the likelihood of having a photon in that particular uh, mode that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So, and the way you use this is that you draw the, the like this is after, after optimization, right? Uh, yeah, so you would you would translate it after the optimization into one of those configurations. Actually, you have uh, you have quite a lot of uh, freedom uh, to draw it. It's very simple to draw some some version, but uh, you have a lot of freedom how you would actually translate the graph to the experiment. Mm -hmm. And there you can uh, take into account a lot of experimental um, uh, properties, for instance. Uh, I don't know uh, which mode, uh, which photonic modes you prefer to work with, and so on. Right. Uh, so, so essentially, what you do is that you you sort of decide the constraints of your problem, like these many photon detectors, these many uh, sorry pathways, these many crystals, and then you draw up the the general graph, like as general as possible, and then you start. Uh, doing your optimization, to topological optimization on that until you get to something like what we're looking at right now. <clears throat> um, I think you had a picture that was before optimization in one of your slides. So when we, the initial graph that we use is the most general graph that we can write down when we specify the number of dimensions that we want to work with which corresponds to the number of color. In this case, this, the four colors, uh, sorry, two colors, and the number of um, uh, photonic paths, or in, in the previous case, the number of photonic detectors that we want to work with. Uh, in this case, there are four detectors. Uh, and, and with this, we start the optimization. But the, the number of detectors, actually, it's not important that you that you restrict yourself to the smallest number. Actually, when you when you would add two additional detectors, um, and the uh, uh, program finds out that you only need four of them, it would lead to a solution where you have one graph that is um, that contains the solution, and a, a unconnected additional uh, two vertices. So you would actually see what is the smallest version. Um, that the solution works with or can work with. Perfect. Uh, and just to confirm, there's a question on YouTube. These mm -hmm. edges are not directed. These are... They, they are not directed. Right. Okay. Cool. So uh, since we don't have a ton of time, let's move on to the topic that I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. So since you go through this approach, 
you're boiling down the graph that you're looking at now to the graph that you were showing before. That was the, you know, simple uh, mm -hmm. square. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a scientist uh, who is familiar with quantum optics can take a look at this graph and essentially conceptually picture what this would look like as an experiment in a lab, which are the options that we, you know, the hypothetical scientists have come up with on the right. Um, and you are saying, I guess, a, a, a very interesting claim of your paper is that this is a conceptual understanding of how uh, th the quantum optics is happening, how the science is happening here. Can you talk about that a little and, you know, just elaborate a little more on that claim of this is how science should be done? Okay. Um, um, what we are saying is that the idea of scientific understanding is central to science. So, um, in addition to optimization and so on, uh, the really, really important thing is that you understand something. That is what uh, philosophers and, and physicists um, who, who write about this topic uh, argue. And so we uh, take this uh, serious and we uh, want to try to go in the direction of um, getting some scientific understanding. Now the question is, what is scientific understanding? Uh, everyone can think about it uh, yourself. What we did is uh, we went to the literature of uh, philosophy and we are trying to understand actually what did uh, those people who were thinking about those questions very hard, what did they come up with? There are several different approaches. For instance, one is the complete neglection of um, scientific understanding as a um, aim of philosopher because uh, um, people have argued that it is uh, psychological and you cannot do real uh, logic law. You cannot build up uh, theories about it. But then afterwards, people really understood that while there are some limitations, you can build up a theory of scientific understanding um, if you think about it in a pragmatic way. And that means that you see uh, that somebody scientifically understood something afterwards. And the idea is very simple. If you um, a scientist can understand something if he can use those concepts fruitfully. Actually, this is a very short, limited summary of uh, Hank Direct's uh, awesome 300 something pages book. But the idea is this you uh, see that you understand something when you can use the concepts in a fruitful way without additional computations. And that is what we have shown. Our solutions, uh, the solution from the computer, uh, was for a special case, for instance, for a six particle three dimensional case. And we were immediately able to understand uh, why that solution worked. And that was understanding that we didn't have before. And we were immediately able to generalize this to many other cases. And thereby, uh, we have shown that we were able to use these concepts uh, fruitfully without computations. And those concepts directly came from uh, the solutions from our program. Perfect. Thank you so much for that expansive uh, answer. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, I wish we had more time to go into more detail, uh, but I'm just going to quickly wrap up what we talked about. Uh, so essentially, the approach that you came up with is kind of you know in the opposite direction than everyone else is probably going, which is going to more data-driven, uh, you know. Uh, sort of without really understanding what's happening on a physical basis and just trying to use the data to map out quantum states. And obviously, because we don't understand, uh, you know, how the machine learning algorithms are working on, you know, say, deep learning level uh, that well, uh, we are still not very efficient on those fronts. But uh, what you're showing here is that we can still use our physical intuition to design, you know, systems that are uh, graphical, uh, graph theoretical basic, uh, on graph theoretical basis, and use that to drill it down to its fundamental cores, and then use those fundamental cores to generalize to more problems that you're interested to understand. Uh, I saw in your paper referring to other uh, approaches in this direction using computational design, topological search, genetic algorithms. 
uh, active learning and even recurring neural networks to map out quantum states to desired proper properties. Uh, but you know, a lot of these are very, very data intensive. Uh, yes. And the advantage of this method, as you showed in your result, uh, is that you know it really uh, you know uh, beats most of these other approaches in terms of performance. So thank you so much, Mario, for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate the great work that you've done here, and hope to have you back here soon again. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot yeah. for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone for joining us. Head to AI.Science, create a free account to get notified about all, all our uh, upcoming events as well. Bye now.